right? So despite the best safeguards, the best controls, and the best um, uh, techniques and statistical analyses, you still find sufficient variation. So if you have to predict if this person is going to purchase a product, that's that's a relatively easier task because you have tons of clean data that you can rely on, right? So in biology, the biggest challenge comes from the fact that I don't know the truth. What is the ground truth? <laughs> uh, I mean, I can't fault anybody because uh, biology is a very difficult beast, right? The, the turnaround, the amount of time it takes to, to productize something. Uh, I mean, although we have like a, uh, an ongoing startup, uh, we've uh, I've, I've previously mentored students on startups and they've had two really bright students who came up with brilliant ideas and after four or five iterations, they just had to give up because they felt that they were solving research problem after research problem after research problem. I really think they could have published three impactful papers, but they literally couldn't get the product out because the, the biology is often poorly understood. And uh, this is why, you know, it's, uh, it's actually a very complex <laughs> beast to, to tackle. Welcome to the Inductive Economy, the podcast where we delve into the intersection of technology, economics, policy, and progress. I'm your host, Vignesh Swaminathan, and today we have a fascinating guest who is at the forefront of bridging the realms of biology and data science. Joining us today is Dr. Karthik Raman, a distinguished researcher and the mind behind groundbreaking work in the field of quantitative biology. Dr. Raman is the visionary leader of the Raman Lab at the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, where his work is pushing the boundaries of what's possible at the intersection of biology and data-oriented research. He is also the co-founder of QBiome Research, a startup based out of Chennai, India. Our conversation today takes us deep into the quantitative nature of modern biology. Dr. Raman discusses the transformative impact of applying rigorous quantitative methods to unravel the mysteries of biological systems, shedding light on how this approach revolutionizes our understanding of life sciences. We also explore the world of data-oriented approaches to conducting biology research. Dr. Raman shares insights into how harnessing the power of data is changing the landscape of biological studies, from understanding intricate cellular processes to predicting complex biological outcomes. Dive with us into the realm of complex systems as Dr. Raman navigates through the intricacies of studying biological phenomena as dynamic and interconnected systems. Discover the beauty and challenges of deciphering the complexity of life through the lens of a seasoned researcher. And last but certainly not the least, we delve into the mindset of the research entrepreneur. Dr. Raman offers a unique perspective on how combining research excellence with an entrepreneurial spirit can drive innovation and create meaningful impact in both academia and industry. Get ready for a captivating conversation that explores the nexus of biology, data science, and entrepreneurship. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Dr. Karthik Raman. So, Karthik, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. It's an incredible privilege and honor to have you on the show. Thanks a lot. I think it's uh, really looking forward to having an interesting discussion. Awesome. So, Karthik, uh, you work in the you work in the realm of uh, computational systems biology, right? I understand computation, I understand systems, I understand biology, but can you piece the three together and explain it if it's okay? Sure, yeah, I think that's a nice way of looking at it. So, in fact, I think uh, I'd like to start with computational and biology, which somehow don't seem to occur in the same sentence, right? At least in uh, in for, for most people. <clears throat> And I think this is changing a lot. Uh, you see a lot of um, uh, young children who are uh, you know, good at math and also like biology. But I always like to think of, like say, 20, 25 years ago, wherein you, you choose to study biology if you don't like math, and you choose to study math if you don't like biology, right? And, um, and this has to change, this is changing. And you see that there are lots of applications for computation in, in biology. Imagine something like uh, genome sequencing, there's no way of going anywhere near that uh, without uh, extremely powerful computers at your disposal. And uh, there are a lot of interesting uh, computational problems that are to be solved in biology. 
and uh, so much so that you know there are some really uh, provocative articles that people have claimed that biology is becoming a fully quantitative science and uh, <clears throat> all biology is actually computational biology so essentially computational biology involves um, looking at various aspects of biology through a computational lens and there are so many quantitative problems to be solved in biology for example uh, i mean uh, nothing better to talk about than genome sequences you see that you know uh, if you are talking about human genome sequences it's about uh, uh, 3 billion base pairs right? and to actually read these 3 billion base pairs just what the whole idea of genome sequencing is and to then understand what is the function that is carried uh, out by each of the genes that are present in this genome sequence and so on all of this requires a lot of uh, uh, computation, computational analysis, uh, mathematical um, models that uh, go into various other aspects and so on. And to go back to your original question about systems biology, <clears throat> the whole idea is that you cannot understand like a really complex system by just looking at a few parts. And you can't like uh, disassemble a, a car or an aeroplane and then eyeball the parts and figure out that, hey, yeah, this is how it's going to work. Because you have lots of emergent phenomena which happen only when <clears throat> complexity happens. So when these complex things uh, uh, come together, then you all, all kinds of interesting behaviors uh, hap uh, happen. And uh, <clears throat> another classic uh, textbook uh, example for that is the is you know the is a blind man and an elephant, right? So if you have a different people looking at different parts of an elephant, they're going to think it's like a rope, a wall, a stick, a spear, or whatever. But nobody has the full picture and um, well today we have the computational wherewithal to try and get the, the you know better models and the full picture and uh, that is where a systems view of um, biological uh, of life of biological cells is coming in and so we like to look at a systems view of biology which is uh, as, and and of course it requires a lot of computation so Right? So that's your computational uh, systems biology. And underlying a lot of this is actually networks. So you know, instead of calling it computational systems biology, one could also call it uh, you know, a network biology is like a very important field inside of computational systems biology. There are so many other aspects, but this whole network thinking, this systems thinking where I understand the fact that a lot of these um, entities are connected to each other and influence each other's function and uh, so on has become so so central to biological thinking in the modern era. So let me just dive one step deeper into that explanation. So what is a system? What is a network? And how do they differ? Yeah. So, I mean, there are networks underlying every system, right? So uh, by a system, we just mean and, and by a complex system, uh, we typically mean not just a large system, because not all large systems are very complex. But what we mean is a highly interconnected system. You, you don't know if you know if I touch X, what happens, right? The the, the, the cascading effects could be like uh, uh, really phenomenal and uh, could be catastrophic in certain uh, scenarios and so on. So what happens when I manipulate a system, right? So one particular point of a system. So to try to understand this better, I think you need to really understand all the layers of networks that underlie these complex systems and this actually holds for uh, complex systems in general right i don't think um, we have i haven't mentioned anything else in the uh, in this discussion that's uh, very specific to biology so whatever i've spoken about so far is uh, uh, pretty much true of all complex systems and well biological systems are even more complex simply because of the uh, uh, because it's difficult to study them Right, you, you can you can't take the system apart, and the very yeah. famous. Uh, I literally feel like I'm doing my first class on my of my course on systems biology because these are all the discussions we actually get into, and there is a very famous article which talks about can a biologist fix a radio? <laughs> yeah. Right, and it, it basically takes the perspective like an engineer's perspective and how biology is all really weird to an engineer because they're used to very well-defined systems and very. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, if to, to make a joke out of this, so how do you study uh, a radio, right? Can you like you know take a, a, a complex system, you remove different, you remove one piece and see if the system works, 
If it yeah. doesn't work, you then conclude that that piece is important for the system to survive. And this is like the classical equivalent of a biological like knockout study or something like that. Because there is no other handle to interrogate a biological system. Because it, it's so complex, you don't really understand the wiring. Today we have so many microscopic techniques and so many other sequencing techniques and so on which have evolved to the point that we are able to understand these systems to some extent, but you still can't, it's not like as well characterizable as an engineering system. Although the, the ultimate goal is to sort of uh, do that to the extent possible. Right? So, so, so this is where the complexity comes in. So, so an engineer would be able to quickly mark out the key components of a system and so on. Whereas in biology, you have to sort of reverse engineer. The system is already in front of you. Now you have to somehow figure out what is the function the system is going uh, doing and how do I uh, go about manipulating it? How do I go about understanding it in the first place and understand it well enough so that I might be able to manipulate it? Right. And it's it's really interesting that, you know, if you can give a little overview on when, when the network-led thinking really came into biology, because... Uh, I think when you say networks, people naturally assume computer science by default to some extent, right? But like when you take a broader view of what a network is, the most uh, amazing network of them all is actually the biological network, right? Uh, because it's anti-fragile, it is self-improving, it is selective, right? It's got a lot of these wonderful, I, I mean, I might sound very amateurish describing my fascination with this, but... Can you give a brief primer on when this network perspective of biology really kicked in and the quantitative side of it or the computation side of it really kicked in as a practice? It's a very good point, right? So so the first thing you need um, whenever you have to study networks, so, and, and here, uh, uh, by the way, you know, the, by networks, we actually mean graphs, right? Graph theory mm -hmm. as, a, as a computer science object. So we're talking about collections of nodes and uh, the, the connections between them. And the easiest network for us to probably think about is like, a, you know, like an airport map or something like that, because you already see that, right? So you see that all the dots represent airports and all the edges or connections represent um, flights and things like that. And this is essentially the same logic that's applied everywhere. And of course, uh, today, uh, social networks are all uh, uh, everywhere. So we understand them uh, very well. Interestingly, I think the, the contribution to network science has been huge from the from the social network side. So a lot of the classic experiments, a lot of the classic scientists uh, all came from the social science uh, uh, space. Although today you see like a huge contribution of biologists, phys physicists of course, like physicists are always uh, you know, rich in any field. And uh, you see that the contributions from these people have become uh, very important. But to go back to your question of when this really started uh, taking shape, I think this was you know, close to the turn of the century, right? So around 2000, which is when the Human, Human Genome Project also uh, completed uh, and so on. So that is when you really started having a much better picture of all the parts within a cell. Yeah. Of course, right, you know, the, the bacterial sequences are available earlier and, and, and so on. And uh, But uh, nothing to really set uh, people going like the Human Genome Sequence. And uh, I would say around the, the, the 90s, uh, then to the 2000s and so on, is when this uh, increasingly became uh, really interesting. And uh, the, uh, if, if you see most biological textbooks, the classic picture you'll see is of a yeast protein interaction network. And that was published in 2001. So, which means that they were at it for at least four or five years uh, prior to that and so on. And it's like a very cool looking picture and where every dot represents a protein in yeast and, uh, and uh, then uh, an edge between two proteins means that the, these two proteins are interacting in yeast and then they studied what happens if each of these nodes is remote from the network right so they of course studied it experimentally and then superimposed that information on your network to have very uh, interesting insights and so on so um, i would say around the last uh, uh, Last decade of the 1900s to early 2000s is where this really started kicking in. But now we've had this network science, network biology. You have books on network science today. And uh, there are like uh, so many interesting things that uh, people have been studying about these networks. So in the context of biological data analysis, 
what kind of data does your lab typically work with and what are your primary objectives in analyzing this data? Yeah. So, uh, so we typically uh, uh, rely on a lot of publicly available mm. data sets and data sets from our collaborators. Um, so, uh, in fact, over the last uh, five, six years, we've uh, really become biased towards uh, what is known as metagenomic data. We try to understand uh, microbiomes. Right? So, this is basically collections of organisms in any particular environment. It could be the, the gut, it could be the skin, or it could be any other uh, environment that you can think of. Right? It could just be the uh, in this room or in a, in a subway, in a train, or uh, so on. In fact, um, we've actually looked at microbiomes from literally the deep sea to outer space. So we've looked at uh, these extreme microbiomes that exist in hydrothermal vents that are found deep below the sea. And we've also looked at uh, what kind of microbes are present aboard the International Space Station. Uh, so so the, the point is in all of these the things, are our main input data is in terms of what is the place, what kind of microbes are present there, what is the count, how much of each of these microbes uh, uh, is, uh, is present. And uh, today these are uh, doable using uh, uh, experimental techniques that tell you uh, what is the abundance of each of these microbes that are present in a given sample and things like that. So this, uh, this is essentially genome sequencing of a different kind and this has become very central to the study of uh, complex microbiomes. And uh, this is one of the main uh, threads of work in our lab. Uh, in fact, we originally started off looking at a lot of metabolic networks. We still do that, uh, but uh, we, we now look at metabolic networks across mic microbes. Right? So a metabolic network is nothing but, so when you take food, it's broken down into various components and so on. So, um, you know, if, we, if you take glucose, it becomes something else in the body. It ultimately produces ATP and energy, right? But there is a complex pathway that um, that is involved in converting glucose or anything else to any, to everything else, right? So the same glucose will ultimately uh, be converted to proteins or fat and other things as well, right? So how do you study all of these? Uh, metabolism seems to be a very important aspect of how even microbes interact with each other and so on. And it has lots of implications for us to understand what kind of relationships exist between microbes in different environments. So we, we focus a lot on the metabolic lens to look at cells. So one way to actually run these kind of analyses is to have some sort of a theoretical investigation framework, right? You have to have some sort of a framework and then you test that framework against what the reaction in the microbiome would be. And then you test whether your hypothesis is actually accurate with what is actually happening on the cell, correct? If I'm not, maybe it is a very simplistic way of it. Uh, absolutely, yes, you're spot on, you're spot on. So, in fact, um, uh, um, I should say that this is a huge uh, motivation for computational and systems biology as well, right? Uh, so, uh, computational and systems biology are most important in telling us what might be the most interesting or informative experiments to do. Because you right. have a whole universe of experiments to, to, to try out and obviously always very limited uh, money to run these experiments. So what is going to be the most informative or the most useful experiment uh, to, uh, to, to to first try out in the lab, right? So so these kinds of, and to, to, to have a priority list of experiments, it's very good to have these computational predictions, which tell you, okay, I think this microbe A is uh, secreting metabolite X, which is picked up by microbe B, and it helps the growth of microbe B. Or this microbe A is secreting some molecule that is killing microbe B. So you, you start coming up with these kinds of hypotheses and then you, you try to do some experiments and try to understand what's, what's really uh, happening. Right? And, and uh, oftentimes the, the interesting part comes when your, uh, your experimental uh, observations are very different from what you computationally predicted. So then you go and try to fix your model. Right? So, so this is what we call the system biology cycle. It's like, uh, similar to a typical design build test learn cycle in engineering but the uh, whole idea is you, you build a model and or, or you start with some hypotheses or even data and yeah. then you you know go to a model uh, and you make some predictions in the model test these in experiments and now you look at the delta between your experiments and the uh, model and see if uh, you know there is some assumption that has to be challenged some other uh, approximation that needs to be given up and so on to tweak and improve your model to make it uh, closer to reality. So one thing that really fascinates me is like, for example, when you 
look at other fields they are having replication crises correct like for example your social sciences etc i know that we are not talking about that but when you are talking about cells how do you, how do you know given that you are working in both a theoretical as well as an experimental mode of actually analyzing uh, biology how do you ensure that there is accuracy and replicability in the kind of experiments that you are running oh this is like a fantastic question and this is something that's been bothering uh, a lot of people more so off late and um, <clears throat> but i would like to decouple this uh, a little right so there is an experimental reproducibility crisis and shockingly <laughs> a computational reproducibility crisis right i think yeah. we need to look at both of these and uh, and <laughs> thanks for bringing this up because this is close to my heart uh, so experimental reproducibility is is a complete beast of its own right so you see papers that are people picked up uh, you know like nature papers and try to repeat the experiments and so on and this is where you know the 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 beast that biology is c- comes to haunt you in the sense that there is so much inherent variability right so despite the best safeguards the best controls and the best um, uh, techniques and statistical analyses you still find sufficient variation and uh, this is uh, one reason for this is that the inherent heterogeneity in biology you take two exactly you took take two clonal e coli cells they're going to behave differently <laughs> right uh, forget about two human beings and uh, right yeah everything else right so when even when you take like cells so which is why today you have this whole uh, field of single cell sequencing where mm-hmm. people stop looking at a collection of cells as a whole but give importance to individual cells within this connect, uh, collection because each of them has a different story to tell and you have like a distribution some things are narrow some things are broad and that's how you ultimately try to do the uh, try to get the understanding but then again i think people have tried to make sure that they report protocols in fact uh, in in reproducibility there is i uh, there is uh, there are again two or three angles to it the first thing is that do you fully understand what's written in the paper okay. they say something but you know is it all the information that you actually need to to reproduce the the study right did they leave out like one crucial one seemingly insignificant information which comes back to haunt you right so so these become very important uh, issues as uh, when you try to reproduce experiments and this is exactly the problem with models as well i have like a really complex model did i leave out one initial condition reporting one initial condition so if you if you put those initial conditions it's a, it's a computer it's it's as it is the exact diametric opposite of a biological system this will work as intended in a deterministic fashion you know a biological system same e coli cell same input same day <laughs> different results are possible different result whereas here uh, you know there is there is no reason why uh, you know if you give the same inputs to a deterministic algorithm like any of our metabolic network metabolic network prediction algorithms you will get the exact same out- output but what if i know only 90% of the input what if i know only 99% of the input the remaining 1% of what i don't know means that i still have to make some assumptions and this is going to come back to uh, to uh, plague me later on so how do i get around this so, so these are some of the challenges so as it is to answer your reproducibility uh, question yes reproducibility is difficult and there are two aspects to it there is biological reproducibility and computational reproducibility and biological reproducibility uh, people have been taking lots of efforts so you have these um, uh, gory detail protocol uh, uh, reporting these days wherein you have to give every single aspect of your protocol so hopefully you've taken out the unknowns out of the equation and and you are consigning yourself only to the <laughs> to the mercy of the uh, heterogeneity in biology right that is you can never take that out of the equation in in computation there are there are two things right so one is uh, to be able to give all the conditions all the model parameters accurately the second thing is the codes okay, so now it's very common in fact if you see every paper published from my lab uh, even from the very first paper there will be an accompanying github repository which has all the codes and if you run that you will get the output and because those are the exact codes that we use to generate the the paper outputs but even so there are challenges right so a, a database that we were relying on has today changed 
So how do you freeze that? So, but but these are all things that uh, scientists are well aware of, and they have been uh, developing technologies and tools to get over these, right? So now you try to build a Docker container wherein you have the exact version of every single tool that you use, and you put it in, you'll get the exact result. And this is where I think journals have become very good today, and they've been insisting on reproducibility. So as a reviewer, I'm required to judge if people have submitted all the required data and tools, if the results look reproducible. It's not practical for every reviewer to run all the tools and uh, uh, check them. But at least, you know, the best effort has been put in by the uh, scientists. All right. And and this is where I get to another interesting aspect of the computation systems biology approach, which is there is a sense that it is inherently interdisciplinary and very pro-collaboration. So can you speak about your experience, you know, collaborating with uh, others and what you learn from other fields when you actually work on something like computation systems biology? I, I think absolutely, right? So this is like the core of this field, I would say. You have to be interdisciplinary. And uh, so I've had students from uh, a chemical engineering background, an electrical engineering background, of course, very commonly a biotech background, which is like a big input to our department and also from a computer science background and so on, right? So I've already worked with all of these people. And similarly, I have collaborations with various departments, right? I work with folks in the chemical engineering faculty in the chemical engineering department and the computer science department and so on and so forth. Of course, within the biotech department itself. And uh, this has become very, very integral to this field because you need to... Um, at least from my perspective, we, we solve lots of problems where the computation can become challenging. So, so that is where the, um, so we are the domain scientists in, in some sense, right? I'm, I'm not a biologist myself, but in, in most of my collaboration meetings, I, I pretend to be the biologist, right? Because I typically know more biology than my uh, computer science collaborator and uh, so on. And, and what happens is that we may have a very nice idea, but to implement it, you need the right data structures and the algorithms and to actually scale them because one big challenge in biology is scale. You typically talk about like a million cells, like a thousands of genes or a million genes. All of these become or you're talking about pairwise interactions between like 100 microbes, right? And all of these become very computationally intractable very quickly. So how do you design scalable algorithms? So this is like a very important thing because you need to scale for systems. I mean, the whole idea of systems biology is scale because you're trying to look at the whole system. You're not going back and looking at one small pathway within a cell. You're trying to look at the entire system to the extent that is permissible by our computational techniques and so on. So for this, you need very strong uh, collaborations. And as always, um, uh, the... Uh, the field itself has touch points to so many other fields. In fact, my, my first brush with systems biology, if you say, came when I was an undergrad student doing chemical technology, where I was exposed to a, a course on process control. And process control is, uh, is a classic chemical engineering course. Every chemical engineer does process control. But it has very direct applications in biology because biological systems are actually control systems. And so, I mean, you, you enter a hot room, uh, you start sweating more, it's all control, right? And, and your body temperature is uh, re remains constant, right? So, so your system immediately uh, uh, reacts to any environmental stimulus and it's a control system at play. You can obviously visualize that. So, and this is very central uh, to, to biology. So, so chemical engineers become a very obvious uh, cog in this uh, <laughs> whole scheme where, you know, you need chemical engineers who are experts at control theory to try and dissect uh, biological systems. And now, of course, with uh, data science, uh, you need data um, science folks from various backgrounds because there are various challenges. Biological data sets are, first of all, they are large. <laughs> They're so large that we often worry about how do I copy this data set from this computer to that computer. <laughs> it's going to take yeah. two hours to copy the file because you're talking about like a few hundred GB files. Yeah. and uh, things like that. So starting from that to the diversity to, you know, the temporal, temporal heterogeneity, whatever, right? So every every axis of complication, you have a tick in <laughs> biological systems. So how do you deal with this? So again, uh, interacting with a lot of data science uh, folks, either from a computer science background or from a chemical engineering background becomes highly advantageous. 
So, so but I would uh, really, uh, 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 one big uh, aspect of my collaborations has been that, especially with computer scientists, this has been really fruitful because we can always come up with an interesting idea or an interesting algorithm. But if it has to really scale, you need experts who, who can sit and do that for you. Right. So that scalability becomes the difference uh, between running it on like a small toy system and a, and a real biological system. So just as a follow up on that, so would you say that would you say that building algorithms to understand these large data sets would be the biggest challenge you face when modeling complex biological systems and networks? Well, uh, I mean, the, the biggest, I mean, it's, it's certainly one of the big, big challenges. The biggest challenge always is, is comes from the data itself, right? So the, the, the quality and quantity and the cleanliness of the data, uh -huh. right? So that is where a lot of our efforts are <laughs> invested. You try to find out, oh, this one sample is, uh, you know, missing here. Why? Because, you know, that there was a problem with the instrument on that day, right? So there is some one long story behind each of those uh, data points. And you have to actually get around all of these because they'll turn up, show up as outliers in your data. They'll be like some, uh, there'll be a, some odd, some odd story around that data point and things like that. So this data becomes one big problem. But then right after that, I think it's the ability to you. You can come up with how many ever smart algorithms you want, but if you can't really implement them appropriately, scale them to the to the scale that is required. For instance, we, we had a study uh, several years ago where we looked at, um, uh, this is actually a, a classic school question. So you have uh, molecule A on the right hand side, you have a, an arrow mark, molecule B on the, uh, okay, A on the left hand side, um, an arrow, arrow mark, a molecule B on the right hand side and a question mark. How do you convert this molecule to this molecule? So in school, we typically answer this from our uh, rote memory of various organic chemistry reactions and uh, things like that. But today we are able to learn these kinds of patterns from uh, databases of chemical reactions and so on. But some of the databases we had, uh, we looked at had around 10,000 reactions. But we wanted to build a system that would scale to hundreds of thousands of reactions. So we artificially made new reactions like that look very similar and so on, expanded the input data set and tested our algorithm on that data set. Right? Because that is like future proofing your algorithm because otherwise Correct. it can work on 10,000 if it breaks down at 100,000, it's not going to be useful five years down the line. And if you see all biological data is, uh, it, this doesn't look exponential, this looks vertical, but this is really how it looks. Right? Yeah. Look at yeah. the accumulation of sequence data, it's a hockey stick. It's, it's, it's almost a cricket bat now, it just goes uh, straight yeah. up. Right. So the, the and this is uh, contributed to by various things. Right. So our ability to analyze these data sets, the decreasing cost of very all of these systems and uh, and the rising importance of these kinds of analyses, uh, which is keeping funding agencies interested in sponsoring these kinds of research and so on. So together, what we see is like a very meteoric rise of uh, all kinds of data. And um, this is why scalability, I think, is a huge challenge that biologists have to, that computational biologists are looking at. <clears throat> so, so I want to focus on three things here now that you actually brought up this, you know, these really interesting ideas. The first is, you know, the researcher, a person who does the fundamental research work. On the second level is the person who guides the next generation of researchers, the person who runs the lab. And on the third level, I'm actually seeing the, the founder, all right. You take these insights that you actually sort of developed in your lab and you go out and productize it. And, you know, you really build products and services out of it. Now, maybe my understanding is wrong, but I think when compute power really meets any field, the potential to really create interesting products and services for the market goes up exponentially is a heuristic that I run with. How true is it? I don't know. Okay. But from your experience, when compute has now met biology, what do you think is going to be the impact in various different sectors that you think are very exciting? It doesn't have to be practical, but the potential of it actually excites you. And I'll come to the other two sections in a bit. Sure. Sure. I think uh, uh, absolutely right because uh, uh, computing has a huge potential in all of these sectors and um, it has... Uh, 
really simplified a, a lot of um, grunt work and things like that right so the kind of analysis you can do it's just so easy to repetitively do a lot of these simulations and so on and examine so many different possibilities that uh, would not have been so easy like say even 5 years ago right and and computing power uh, moore's law continue to continues to hold <laughs> and uh, it's like uh, you know uh, you you continue to be able to get so much computing out of like a simple desktop cpu today that you can still uh, run very difficult uh, simulations very complex uh, sequencing uh, runs and uh, things like that on a on a desktop computer of course you know we also tap into large workstations uh, gpus clusters and so on Mm-hmm. but um definitely you know it, it's it's making a difference and um, the, the the challenge though is that <clears throat> one um, unlike many other fields right uh, there is um, if if you're looking at say um, uh, like say uh, so something like um, uh, advertisement or amazon or something like that right so if you have to predict if this person is going to purchase a product that's that's a relatively easier task because you have mm-hmm. tons of clean data that you can rely on correct right? so in biology the biggest challenge comes in the fact that i don't know the truth what is the ground truth <laughs> so you you end up starting without this knowledge of the ground truth and that becomes a huge challenge whatever be the problem that you well, let's say you know we we talk about uh, drug design right? that, that's a very uh, you know it's, it's a favorite problem if you look at the pharma industry it's like a billion dollar problem and you have all these uh, famous quotes from pfizer and so on they say that uh, we have to figure uh, how to fail uh, uh, 90% of the time and not 95% of the time right you can like really double your productivity by failing 90% of the time but that's how difficult the problem is because you have so many um, hundreds of thousands of molecules that enter the drug discovery pipeline and barely one or two make it out at the end it, it's it's just how this whole uh, complex uh, pipeline is so today if, um, there are people who are using uh, various algorithms uh, to try and design new drugs right so so drug like molecules or drugs that will go and bind to a specific protein in uh, um, your yeah, covid virus or wherever right? so how do you, you you can scale today you can try out millions of simulations and you can change the million to billion <laughs> today or shortly you have that computational yeah. muscle to do that but how you still have to go and validate these in the lab and you still have the worry of some un- unknown side effects some un, un- uh, some things that uh, have not been budgeted for or predicted by any of the models right we've been building better and better models to really try and capture what is going to be the effect of this drug in a patient but then there's still so much more to be done so this is what is uh, hampering but there's definitely so much potential for c- computing and um, Uh, and you will see with you know these things like generative ai and uh, so on these things are really going to take a turn over the next uh, few years uh, you you see quickly that uh, these ideas are uh, having widespread applicability and it's it's only a matter of time before there's like a very uh, tangible impact on uh, computational biology and biology in general yeah that was going to be my next question actually which is did you have any did you have a chance to Uh, run any of your data sets with an LLM to see what insights you get with it. Yeah, so I actually haven't put these data sets, but you know, more in terms of um, interacting with these LLMs and so on. So it it seems to have the ability to really um, uh, process text very well, uh, right? So so that that's definitely there. But in terms of what kind of insights you can int- uh, extract from, uh, like say, uh, like a genome sequence or things like that, I think. as always the 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 catch will be the availability of quality training data so how do you train these to to do well but that said i think people are uh, dealing with uh, far more difficult problems today than where they were dealing with uh, 10 years ago so a lot of right. i mean if you take something like um, alpha fold right so that's been like a I was, huge impact and i was i was actually going to come to alpha fold as a matter yeah. of fact because so i think alpha fold is not perfect and um, yeah yeah It, it exactly goes wrong when you have like a very minor it cannot so let's say it predicts the structure of a protein perfectly and you make like a very tiny change to the protein sequence it it, it does not capture the ultimate falls apart yeah right it, it is not able to capture these tiny changes although the broad overall structure is fantastic right and and you will see that that's going to be like uh, it's going to have a huge impact over the next few years 
because we have 100,000 um, uh, solved structures, experimentally solved structures, and today suddenly it's a few million decent structures or like high high confidence structures that have come out of alpha fold. So it really changes your view of protein structure space. I don't work in that field per se, so I'm uh, you know I, I'm sure experts will have a deeper opinion on this. But uh, as a computational biologist, for a computational biologist, the biggest gap all the time has been that you want to understand the function of biological molecules. That's always the goal. And suppose you want to study, uh, know the function of a protein, you need to know its structure. But instead, we go with the sequence. Because, I mean, the idea is sequence maps to structure and so on. But you have the converse where, you know, one small change in the sequence will give you sickle cell anemia. Right? Correct. So this is like a well-known school textbook example. So a small change can lead to a large change in structure. But typically, with 30% similarity between sequences, you have a decent, you know, a passable similarity, a serviceable similarity in protein structures as well. <clears throat> and so you use that to make so many predictions and so on. But today you can actually take the sequence, run it through alpha fold, get a far stronger candidate for your structure and use that for predictions, right? So this is all going to impact fundamentally how bioinformatics is done. So bioinformatics is a field that has relied on sequence to function. And, and now you can really try to see how to bridge this and, 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 uh, and go further, right? use, use more usable information such as uh, or um, protein structure is closer to the function space, so to speak. Right? You have sequence, uh, structure, function, which is actually close by and you have to start with sequence typically. And um, so and again, right, so you have DNA sequence which gets transcribed to RNA and you use all of the and and we know that RNA or transcriptomic analysis, RNA is not sufficient to capture cells, but it's easy to measure compared to the Correct. protein. So you go with that. So these are all the challenges that I think will incrementally get solved over the next uh, few years. And and just as a throwback, when you what is your reaction when you came across the original alpha fold breakthrough? You know, what did you when you read it? What was your reaction? Yeah, I, I think the, the, the first thing was that how beautifully they had cast the problem. Okay, wait, wait, wait. I, I, I'm sorry I'm interrupting you here. I'll break it into two parts, okay? First is, when you saw it publicly being spoken about, what was your reaction? And then when you actually took the, when you took the paper and you actually read what they had actually done, what was your reaction then? Like you're speaking to a colleague and they tell you about alpha fold, right? So when they were describing it, how did it make you feel? And then when you actually went back and read the paper, how did that make you feel? Yeah. So, so I think, um, uh, well, there was a lot of hype, but almost none of the hype was uh, unfounded, <laughs> right? So <laughs> it's it's probably the biggest step towards solving the the most talked about <laughs> problem, right? Which is uh, protein folding, because protein folding is so essential, so central to every quest, right? Be it drug discovery or uh, Anything because you all, as I was just mentioning, right, you always want this sequence structure function thing. And uh, so this pipeline is sort of what alpha fold addresses. And uh, I think they've, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing how, you know, the, how well they had cast the problem and how they were able to make such a, an impactful, uh, such impactful predictions that, that perform so well compared to say experimental predictions, right? So this has become, this has uh, definitely been uh, obviously a huge breakthrough <laughs> in the last uh, few years so i'll come to this uh, i'll come to the third part which is we spoke about the researcher the lab leader and the entrepreneur so i think we spoke about the researcher we'll come to the lab 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 leader uh, but i want to talk about the entrepreneur or also a co-founder of a startup called qbio right so i think it's really incredible that you are not willing to simply publish papers and sit inside academia. Maybe what I'm saying might be harsh, out of place. I agree it can be wrong, but I'm telling you what I'm honestly feeling. That there are a lot of academics who publish, but rarely take their ideas and apply it in the world against capital, against risk, against expectations, right? And as a technical founder, what has your journey been and what advice would you have for people who are studying technical fields, whether it is in chemistry, whether it is in chemical engineering, whether it is in, you know, uh, nuclear or petroleum or aeronautical, 
that it's very important to do lab work, but come out and build products and build companies and build services. I think that's, uh, that's definitely important. One needs to look at uh, solving real world problems, right? And instead of, you know, going around with a hammer and searching for a nail. But, but the challenge, of course, is that, um, uh, I mean, I can't fault anybody because uh, biology is a very difficult beast. Right, the the turnaround, the amount of time it takes to, to productize something is huge. So I've I've actually uh, I mean although we have like a, uh, an ongoing startup, uh, we've uh, I've, I've previously mentored students on startups, and they've had two really bright students who came up with brilliant ideas, and after four or five iterations, they just had to give up because they felt that they were solving research problem after research problem after research problem. I really think they could have published three impactful papers but they literally couldn't get the product out because the, the biology is often poorly understood and uh, this is why you know it's uh, it's actually a very complex <laughs> beast to to tackle so i think that's uh, that's definitely a put off for a lot of people because uh, because the competition is against like somebody who makes a, a quick app yeah, yeah. <laughs> right and uh, so so deep tech versus uh, the, the, so bio, there is biology on the one side, there is deep tech, and there is uh, well, the rest of it. There's the rest of it, right? So how do you really? So uh, so, e so even deep tech is already hard, and biology is exponentially harder than that. So and and even in our uh, company, it's uh, one of the one of the things has been a real challenge. So we are uh, essentially a research con consultancy company. So we, um, we work with pharma and uh, FMCG and so on to solve very specific problems that they have, right? So it could be uh, how to produce a particular molecule, how to improve the efficiency of production of a particular molecule, or it could be a scientific question, or why is this particular thing happening in my system? So in all of these things, it's uh, the, you need an appetite for research for sure. And uh, if, um, no, if, if you are profitable and if you are comfortable, there's no reason to step outside your com comfort zone for, for a lot of people. And uh, this has been the, the, the challenge for us. Right? So how do you pull people to come outside their comfort, uh, comfort zone and think about how this, this, you know, uh, this piece of research can actually make a big impact to your company's bottom line and so on. So uh, this is very important. And um, I think there are uh, multiple layers of challenges here. So we need uh, young students to be taught about entrepreneurship taught up taught about uh, finally what counts right it's uh, i think we get very go good scientific training but in terms of what actually matters in the industry right how you address practical problems how you handle compliance how do you handle regulatory uh, uh, approvals how do you handle ultimately have a profitable economic process in in, in place so uh, these become challenges and um, i'm not sure how different fields are exposed to it. So uh, I consider myself a little exposed to it because I studied at the Institute of Chemical Technology where there was always this industry interface and so on. So we had a course on chemical process economics and things like that. But but still, that's still theoretical at the end of the day. You really need practical hands-on uh, uh, you know, work to understand uh, what translates, what will work. Because when I talk to uh, folks in the industry and doctors and things like that, I, I see their perspective, right? So they tell me right, to have a, a productive process or like a, a feasible, viable uh, process, Desirable. you need to have yeah. X percent, you know, you need to be 50 percent more profitable than what currently exists, right? So that's really not how a scientist thinks. A scientist should think that 10 percent is a great jump, right? But that, that just gets lost when you go through the whole marketing and the, the whole uh, process and so on. So these are all very interesting perspectives that uh, well, we need to train young students with. <laughs> I, I also want to add one more dimension to it, which is, I think, when you really think about bringing entrepreneurship in into these sort of deep tech areas, one thing is to really talk about the nuts and bolts of actually running the business, which I agree that, yes, there needs to be a lot more exposure to that. But I think... Even more than that, I think, do you think that we do a poor job in actually establishing the opportunities in India for these type of products and, you know, services that people can actually build? Because if you even take rare diseases, for example, right? 
So you have a registry, you have a repository, you have some structures, you have some amount of data to actually go with. Now, again, I understand there are exponential costs, there is exponential compute power that is actually required, and there's a lot of investment that will actually be required to actually go through the trials to get through any level of the discovery process, right? Uh, but I think somewhere in the quest for building companies, are we forgetting whom we are serving is my question. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I think it's a complex uh, thing, uh, but I do think there are lots of opportunities available today, uh, right? So there's, uh, this uh, um, Bayrak, for example, has lots of uh, grants for various kinds of entrepreneurs of different uh, uh, sizes and shapes. And uh, I think all this is like a big plus today. And uh, I think it's, 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 it's competitive and we do get lots of interesting applications, interesting startups and there have been a few good startups that have come even in the bio biology space. And I have to say even in the biology space because it's an uphill task, right? So yeah. you need to look at, uh, there are just so many challenges to navigate this space. And uh, because you need, I think, orders of magnitude more patients than you would in other fields. So it definitely makes it a lot more challenging, especially for youngsters who, you know, who are in the prime of their life and, you know, they are like looking to get, you know, into a, you know, a settled job and things like that, but they have so much of uncertainty and uh, the, the things like that. So it's, it's, it's a difficult uh, ch challenge to surmount. And um, I think it's just the individual passion which will finally count because that's the only thing that can overpower all these other uncertainties and so on. And uh, definitely, right, I think... Um, there are different schemes and I think we will see that there are, um, I think the state governments have come up with different schemes and things like that. So all of these are eventually going to have a trickle down effect. So uh, I'm an optimist and I always see that, uh, you no know, things have been, things are definitely way better today than they were 10 years ago and uh, okay. very likely to accelerate further as well. Understood. And now that brings me to the second part, which is the lab leader, which is your, uh, you run your own lab uh, at IIT Madras and you're also a core member of uh, the Robert Bosch Center for Data Science and AI, right? So what is the experience of actually being in a lab and doing re literal lab work as a young student, as a young person? And how can it be transformative in their journey to decide whether they want to be an academic, an industry professional or a founder? Yeah. So this is actually a, a, a tough question for me to answer simply because uh, surprisingly um, a lot of my students have gone on to academic positions so far, right? The, the couple of them have gone into the industry, but uh, a very large majority has go, have gone on to academic positions. Although I do have lots of close interactions in the industry and I do see positions where these students can fit in, but uh, um, looks like they're very passionate about academic positions as well. And uh, academic positions are actually getting harder and harder. It's, uh, you know, it's really not, uh, um, uh, you, you teach, you do research. There's just so many things that you have to do today to, to be a, a, a full academic. And um, uh, that's a quite, a quite a challenge. But I think the most important aspect of, you know, running a lab is to have an environment with diverse people, with people who speak different languages. Uh, I mean, uh, well, uh, our vernaculars are definitely welcome, but even in terms of the science, right? So there is a computer scientist who speaks differently, who thinks differently from a physicist or like a, 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 a biologist, right? And you have all of these people talk together. It's, it's always fun. And uh, it's just important to have passionate people. And uh, I just really like it. And uh, I uh, sit and watch from the sides when... It's like a heated argument going on about like a model, right? Like this is the way to do it or that's the way to do it, right? So it's it's like very nice when um, you have students from different backgrounds. And what I've seen is that a lot of all of these students are, uh, most of them have been very enthusiastic in contributing to other people's work. Right? So there is a presentation that a student is doing and there is an, another student who actually understands only half of it because it's really not their cup of tea. But still, you know, they take the effort to fully understand what's going on and to try to give useful suggestions and so on. And it always happens that there'll be like one really useful suggestion that has a very nice impact on the uh, the, the study that we are doing and uh, the things like that. So 
it's it's very important to have these large uh, these uh, uh, these groups where you have diverse people and larger groups right so there are larger groups where as you were mentioning the uh, the center for data science and uh, ai we are now a school of data science and ai and we have uh, people from very different uh, labs who will come and sit in uh, we have this um, day long showcase where we have 60 poster presentations and and these posters span computational chemistry computational biology computational material science um, actual deep learning reinforcement learning and so on uh, transport applications and the whole spectrum and you have all these people talking to each other right and in fact the reason why we originally set up this center was this uh, funny story that we used to joke that uh, almost every lab uh, in, involved with the center has independently implemented certain al- the same algorithm on their own <laughs> Yeah. Like there is so much of reinvention of the wheel that happens and this this actually reduces and this becomes a synergy when people start talking to each other in these large meetings and uh, and uh, nice settings like you know poster presentation is a very uh, comfortable setting to really chat and discuss and so on so it's like a lot of fun so i think these are the key ingredients so get diverse people give them and uh, typically my students have uh, a lot of freedom they they keep telling me that they are happy with it but i i keep asking them do you think you know you need a more structured uh, approach and uh, so on but uh, they have like a lot of freedom to try what they want to and try and fail and uh, i usually don't uh, put too many strong deadlines on them and uh, uh, things like that um, so it's so you need an environment which uh, fosters this uh, that they need to be happy and uh, passionate got it so karthik my next question is that you know can you explain the concept of uh, in silico metabolic engineering and its significance in your labs research sure <clears throat> so so this is this is in fact one of the key reasons why we set up qbiome as well because you want to take these um, and um, like let's say there's a, there's a vitamin that's being produced so today is probably being produced chemically how do you produce it biologically right? because the the kind of the treatment processes that you have to follow the kind of pollutants that emerge out of your system all of these things are being taken into account and there's a push from the government from uh, uh, international agencies to to go more towards biological processes and so on so how do you figure out how to make like a vitamin using a biological system right so you first have to try and figure out what is the pathway what is the route to producing the system and then you have a cell which seems to produce most of it has most of these pieces but not all of these so you may have to take a couple of pieces from some other cell and put it into this and then figure out what is going to be the productivity of this system is it viable enough for you to run a process with it will it be commercially viable feasible so these are the questions and <clears throat> i have a system that's producing like, like a vitamin and now how do i make it produce more of it how do i which road should i widen in the cell which road should i sh- shut down in the cell to make this happen you have a cell that's producing a particular molecule and you f- it has you know various parts of it and you you try to basically ha- you have a pathway that produces something now how do you produce more of it because that's what's required to make it commercially viable so metabolic engineering is about is about predictively figuring out what roads to shut down and what roads to widen in the cell so that you have more of the output that you want as you know one of my colleagues used to remark uh, the life of a cell is how to take substrate and make it into biomass like cellular mass and the life of a metabolic engineer is take substrate and make it into your vitamin product whatever is the commercially important product right it could be a nutraceutical it could be a vitamin it could be whatever so how do you redirect the cell uh, cells visionary such that you don't compromise growth so much because you want the cells to grow and multiply and so on and also produce enough of whatever it is that you want it to produce right so so this becomes a challenge and so you have to simulate so i have 1000 genes in the cell which of those genes do i knock out and this is where a systems perspective becomes really useful because now i see the whole system i know that if i touch this particular gene here something is going to happen here so all of these interactions i try to identify and that's the whole crux of in silico metabolic engineering i make predictions that we then test out in the lab with our collaborators uh, with uh, people who actually work on real cells and so on make these um, uh, modifications manipulations and figure out how it has had an impact on the production of that particular molecule for example we worked on uh, with my colleague uh, professor uh, smita shivastav we worked on uh, producing tocopherol or vitamin e using sunflower cell lines 
and uh, we had almost a tenfold over production of tocopherol following our engineering steps right and these are predicted using metabolic models and these models are actually uh, relatively simple they are basically like your um, uh, for a, uh, you know for those who studied science you, physics you have studied the kirchhoff's law right so it's how charge gets distributed in a circuit so this is similarly how mass gets distributed in a network you can think of it as a system of pipes through which water is flowing right i want to maximize the flow through one pipe so which pipes do i close and open so that more water flows through my uh, outlet and uh, this is the optimization problem that we need to solve and there's lots of computational jugglery we do to get around these problems and uh, definitely this is impactful especially when you try to test it out in a lab and you have uh, very promising results at the end of the day because that is the proof of the pudding so till that you know any non amount of predictions you make uh, you're not very happy or confident but once you see them working in the lab you really think that this is uh, has a potential for huge impact and what future developments do you anticipate or hope for in the fields of uh, computational biology and biological network analysis i mean the, the field itself is so vast so i think there are going to be uh, inputs from uh, various aspects but um, i think the ability to study uh, biological systems at scale at resolution has become a very important uh, a very powerful step in our journey so today you can see single cells and how they interact with each other and this heterogeneity has been a bane in biology but it's 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 the time to sort of convert it into a boon because once you unravel it once you understand it you might be able to unlock uh, a, a lot more interesting things about biological systems that we haven't been able to tackle so far so i think this is definitely going to be one huge area and clearly this is uh, going to keep computational folks super busy because the, when the scale just explodes instead of looking at uh, 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 one cell you're going to look at 1000 or 10000 cells right so your scale is just going to expand in 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 that fashion and um, it's going to keep the computational folks really really busy and uh, you know my follow up to that is you know how do you envision your labs work on impacting future scientific research healthcare biotech etc yeah so so there are so, so many domains i think currently we are a little uh, slightly obsessed with the microbiome because we see a lot of potential for the microbiome so we are working on uh, trying to understand how it inf- impacts uh, uh, infants okay, so infant uh, diarrhea is a huge problem in india and uh, can you actually understand what kind of microbiomes or microbes contribute to these uh, factors so these are things that we are studying and also in many other environments for instance we are also hoping to study environmental microbiomes and things like that for instance uh, uh, corals you see that a lot of corals are getting bleached and so on and there is an increasing role that's been identified for the microbiome microbes that are present amongst these corals to in how they are impacting so um, the the algorithms the methodologies that we are developing i think will be really useful to try and understand what kind of interactions are happening and how do you make these interventions how do you manipulate these microbiomes and that's definitely going to be a huge thing there's a uh, the, there's a lot of challenges here because you don't have the, the best models you still don't have fully characterized microbiomes and <coughs> there is a, there is a bias towards bacteria whereas you know fungi are also present in huge quantities and and there's like a lot of dark matter there which we don't know what it is a lot of uncon- unculturable microbes so there are uh, in any direction i turn there are so many interesting questions that uh, that are there and uh, i think the challenge for us is to actually prioritize the most interesting and uh, and uh, not just the most interesting ones but with the ones which we are most likely equipped to answer and try to make a contribution in that all right So Karthik thank you so much for this I am going to proceed into a rapid fire segment so I want to know your quick thoughts on this and if you want to give a more detailed broad answer please feel free sure so my first question to you is what is one piece of advice you would give your younger self <laughs> okay so I think I, this is something I probably did, but uh, probably could do it even more. Is that uh, you know try to do as many as many courses as possible. Right? Expose yourself to as many areas as you can. 
and uh, to my credit i did uh, audit courses from aerospace engineering cell biology and <laughs> so on when i was at iasc and um, and i think uh, i i couldn't do this as an undergrad as an undergrad we had like a completely set curriculum which is probably yeah. not believable for most people but uh, i didn't have a single elective in my uh, undergrad and my whole reason for uh, you know the the masters course that i joined was that oh wow there are so many electives that i can uh, and uh, already at that point of time i i was like uh, trying to see how i can com- couple my uh, my fundamental knowledge in c- computational science which was the masters i was doing with domain so we were looking at uh, uh, computational courses such as computational approach to drug discovery which was taught by my phd advisor and um, that that really became uh, instrumental in figuring out what area i would go into in the future and uh, so on but so so the advice is that today there's just so much information that's out there there are so many interesting online courses there's just so much out there so you can't claim that i haven't studied something right go pick up a book and read it <laughs> right so okay. i always uh, this is something that i uh, heard some of you can no longer give the excuse of i'm not an expert in this yeah nobody expect you to be an expert in this but uh, but have working knowledge of that field that you're work, uh, you're uh, you're getting into because it's all interdisciplinary and uh, it's a big challenge and uh, it's it's something that i'm still tackling the first advice that i got here when i joined iit as a faculty was the Uh, my uh, director told me that karthik be really careful you'll fall between two stools and i'm still trying to juggle that be very careful because uh, i'm sure some people think that uh, he, he doesn't know any biology and other people think that he doesn't know any computer science but <laughs> this is the the tight rope that interdisciplinary folks have to walk today and uh, so the other piece of advice is be brave <laughs> don't it, it's it's not a big deal right so and so expose yourself to a lot of um, uh, various kinds of science various kinds of talks i think that's huge at iisc the kind of talks from different people we used to have was amazing and uh, even here like there are seminars every day every week uh, today i really don't find enough time to attend all the seminars that i wanted to and uh, that's a challenge but other than that i think uh, nothing educates you more than that really <laughs> uh what are some books that have changed the way you think and engage with the world oh uh so uh, so lots of interesting books so uh, i uh, hand out a lot of um, um, books to my um, uh, st- students as well <laughs> right so i have these uh, attendance prizes where when students uh, have, uh, have 100% on time attendance in my course so this is my way of reinforcing them they get a book at the end of the semester and uh, so yesterday was the final exam and i just gave out like seven different books to these people and um, usually typically popular science books and biographies and uh, the things like that but uh, a lot so, of so so which 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 were those seven <clears throat> so so i really can't put my finger on one particular book but um, i really la- uh, like this book called where ideas uh, where good ideas come from by uh, steven johnson i think that was like uh, really impactful in terms of uh, really seeing uh, giving a process to innovation right so innovation is uh, you think it's like a creative spark but how do you how do you engineer the conditions to facilitate those creative sparks i think uh, you know that, that's a that's a very uh, cool thing and um, i also really like this book uh, which i think i mentioned in our previous chat it's uh, it doesn't sound great it says it sounds something like this will make you smarter but uh, it's a collection of so many eclectic uh, essays that uh, that gives you a different perspective on so many interesting topics and uh, because there is always i always think that there is an interesting idea in field x that i haven't looked at which is going to solve all my problems right? and that that keeps happening so so in fact we uh, we looked at uh, uh, like a, a very interesting kind of uh, robustness aspect in biology and so how it could actually impact uh, how we will engineer our line networks and things like that so there's always this translation you can do across fields and um, i also teach my students a lot about these biomimetic algorithms and uh, dna computing and things like that these are things that are still somewhere uh, at least dna computing is borderline science fiction because i mean you have the classic studies are like 20 years old 30 years old but <laughs> you really don't have enough uh, real life examples of that but uh, today students are just so excited to tinker with biology and uh, a big piece of uh, uh, thing i learned from my students is that they said today we need to go and advise people like we were telling people 20 years ago study math 
today we have to t- go and tell them study biology <laughs> right so that is how important yeah. biology has become and math has become and students need to sort of uh, 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 straddle these and of course like uh, lots of biographies have been like uh, very very impactful like uh, a man who knew infinity definitely <laughs> right to understand one of our own like uh, rama rajan who was a uh, complete uh, oddball <laughs> the way he used to think the way he used to solve problems the way he used to uh, extremely socially challenged uh, the way he used to interact with people and yet an extremely extremely successful mathematician who had huge uh, flaws and failings so it's like a uh, a wonderful lesson in life as well <laughs> something i always encourage students to study um uh, fermas last year um <laughs> again a really uh, exciting book and uh, even yesterday i g- gifted it out to one of the students uh, it really looks at how single minded pursuit of a single question very difficult for scientists to do that but uh, well andrew wiles did achieve that so these are some interesting books i can pick off the top of my head my students of course uh, blame that i am a little biased towards uh, my list of books that i offer them they can they are free to pick outside the list but the list uh, apparently contains too many math books <laughs> uh, uh, rather than anything else but uh, yeah perfect perfect what 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 annoys me about other people that i sometimes do myself <laughs> um difficult to put a finger on but um and so i would say that uh, you know uh, i would slightly paraphrase this question of you know what advice would you give people that you can't follow yourself which is uh, don't multitask <laughs> right so you need okay. to monotask to actually accomplish meaningful stuff and when you do it, it it's it's awesome and th- th- that again i'll i'll bounce off on the previous question for that this is uh, wonderful book called make time i read right i read deep work also which i think a lot of people uh, love and uh, talk about but uh, i re- particularly like make time as uh, a really practical book on how you you reclaim your day and uh, turn aside distractions and things like that so while i've turned aside a lot of distractions and so on it's, it's still very difficult to not multitask and uh, you know there are so many tasks on your table that you try to keep uh, pushing and for a scientist it's very important to sit on a single task and i wish i would do more of that okay uh my next question is what's your go to method for overcoming procrastination uh say that again what's your go to method for overcoming procrastination or writer's block yeah yeah so so again right so so focus on a task right so so any time you turn off all the other tasks that you have to work up uh, work on and uh, this i have seen that this is typically because of how um, um how, how busy the day generally gets right so there's so many emails to answer there are so many uh, small tasks that need to be done so you can't really put in like a solid 2 3 hours on uh, uh, i know people talk about this uh, pomodoro and 25 minutes but i really think that we do have the stamina to go 2 3 hours on certain things right so when i set an exam paper or when i um, uh, try to write on a paper write a paper try to set aside 2 uh, 3 hours and um, i i think it works because uh, i'm 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 really tardy on whatsapp uh, in fact i have whatsapp notifications turned off which uh, probably annoys a lot of people but it helps me really get through work and um, i also see that when there are certain tasks that don't really get done i need to break them down into smaller doable chunks i don't th- think there is something i've succeeded at doing fully but i can uh, see the merit in doing that and have uh, occasionally succeeded in that as well if you could time travel 25 years into the future what are the top 3 questions you want answers to regarding the state of technology and society <laughs> so yeah so this is a uh, um, <coughs> yeah so the first question is that uh, what are all the things that people have stopped doing because of chat gpt <laughs> okay have people nice. stop coding Uh, have people stopped coding uh, have people stopped um, uh, writing emails <laughs> have people I, i think this is like the one question i really want the answer to because um, chat gpt today is doing things that i couldn't dream of one year ago right i just ask it a very generic question with some i paste a piece of code and it tells me how to refactor it 
<laughs> right? I think I'm a good coder and uh, chat GPT tells me that, hey, you should be doing these, these things with your code. It totally understands my code, <laughs> uh, right? And uh, this is just amazing. And um, um, I, I really like this um, one thing. I um, Maybe I'm going to take a second to pull up the exact code. So uh, I think this has influenced me a lot. One of my friends told me this uh, a few months ago. And it says that uh, John Adams was the uh, America's first vice president and second president. And when asked if he studied arts during yeah. his visit to France, he replied with the following quote. He said, I must study politics and war mm -hmm. so that my sons may have the liberty to study mathematics and philosophy. My sons ought to study mathematics and philosophy, geography, natural history, naval architecture, navigation, commerce, and agriculture. In order to give their children a right to study painting, poetry, music, architecture, uh, statuary, tapestry, and porcelain. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So yeah, I yeah, think, yeah, 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 yeah. and I, I would also conveniently include basic science in that, <laughs> right? Blue sky research, and uh, like say, yeah. uh, of course. Right? So to translate this for a scientist, it's like um, we need to solve. Uh, work on really difficult problems that are plaguing uh, India and the world currently so that our children can do whatever research they want to do, right? They work blue sky research. They actually try to understand what happens when I, uh, you know, okay, how can I, uh, uh, you know, make this um, uh, protein fold differently, right? Without worrying about whether I'm going to be able to make a drug out of it or anything like that. I just want to understand. Uh, I just want to understand the world yeah. the way it is, <laughs> right? So I think these are yeah. like... Um, and I think this is a progression, right? So if you see uh, uh, generation after generation, the, the focus uh, shifts. You you do see the younger generations driven by so many different things, right? And you, you can definitely say, at least in India, you can see that um, a few generations ago, I mean, people were obviously chasing Roti Kapra Makan. And uh, once Correct. you have that, what is the next thing you go to, right? Do you still chase after, uh, like, you know, money? Or do you still do you chase after uh, impact? Do you chase after... Uh, you know, enjoying the work that you do. Right? So these are all questions that I have to, I end up discussing with students because their placement season is on us now. So next month, everybody is going to be worried about what kind of job they're going to go into, what kind of uh, life that awaits for them. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's so important to have uh, fun. So, so going back, answering the long answer to your question is, I would just ask one question that, have people been able to do what they really want <laughs> instead of doing things that other people want and drudgery and, uh, you know, coding and all, all kinds of other things. Uh, has AI been able to help people realize their potential, right? <laughs> because that's this one side of the thing that, uh, you know, talks about like an AI doomsday and things like that. I, I don't belong to that group. I'm an optimist, of course. But the thing is, has uh, AI helped people to really focus on more exciting things for themselves, What whatever that could be, right? Perfect, perfect. Uh, if you had to condense your life philosophy into one sentence, what would it be? Yeah, I think it's, um, <clears throat> and this is something that uh, one of my uh, teachers told me in uh, college as well, right? So you have an input, you have a process and you have an output. Um, the output, um, uh, input is whatever you are, whoever you are, is, uh, you know, you, you can make a few changes to that. Um, uh, process is the longest part of this box, right? Process happens for a long time. The output is where, you know, you get a paper, you get an award, you win a World Cup, you lose a World Cup, and so on, right? So that's like something that's very, very fleeting, right? But if you fix the process, if you enjoy the process, then, you know, you can really, uh, I, I think that's important because, uh, it's like, you know, if you enjoy your work, every day is a holiday, right? So you need to make sure that you enjoy the process. And uh, that's just only so much you can do about the outcomes, right? And as all of us are smarting from the World Cup defeat, but we know that we had a process which helped us win so many games in the last uh, three World Cups compared to any other team, right? So okay. it's, uh, of course, right, you know, there is a very materialistic side which says that, uh, uh, the cup is what counts, but um, I think as a uh, as a as a teacher, I must advise the students that hey, you need to get your process right and you need to enjoy the process so that you can be happier. Right. And what's a recent discovery or a piece of information that has blown your mind? 
I mean, uh, to say something that's like truly mind blowing, I think it's uh, definitely alpha food <laughs> because this, this was always seen like a problem that could never be tackled. And uh, similarly, I think uh, very close on those heels is something like chat GPT, where, uh, you know, you have, uh, of course, there are like many challenges there, but uh, you still see that, you know, it can do certain things um, so shockingly well that uh, we didn't think was possible, like say five years ago. So I think all of those are like, um, uh, huge and um, <coughs> in terms of my own science, <coughs> I think what really um, excites me is that um, the ability to study uh, biological cells at the kind of resolution, the kind of sequencing technologies that we are getting right, and the fact that they are becoming dirt cheap is going to impact us in ways that we haven't yet thought about. And uh, <coughs> so <laughs> really exciting times for youngsters to enter uh, this exciting interface between computing and biology and make huge impacts there. Absolutely. What's the most valuable piece of advice you've ever received and who gave it to you? I think I, uh, uh, I, I can't put my finger on one thing, but <clears throat> the one thing that really comes close is that uh, what I just uh, mentioned earlier in terms of enjoy the process, right? Because there's um, the, because uh, a lot of times uh, we used to you know, uh, make fun of certain students, right? So you're always, when you're at IIT, you're trying to find out what's your next job. And when you're at your next job, you're trying to find what's the next thing, right? So when are you going to enjoy the time that you are in? So it, it's very important to enjoy the time that you are, the, your, your present life. And uh, <clears throat> I mean, uh, it, it's always nice to look back and say, oh, I had so much fun as a kid. I had so much fun as a college goer or whatever and so on. But I think... We need to uh, have a lot of value for the time that you live in, right? And whatever is it that you're doing today, I think uh, taking a lot of happiness out of it and seeing the fun in it, I think uh, that's probably the most uh, uh, valuable thing. Perfect. And my final question to you is, what's one daily habit or routine that has had a profound impact on your life? So I'm, I'm an early riser. I think that's like uh, really important because uh, it, it really gets you, um, uh, you know, it, it gives you a huge head start for the day. It's like a big cliche and, but uh, yeah. it's, it's definitely like um, uh, really impactful. So, you know, you can really start working early when you have no emails to trouble you, you have, so you, you, you enable, uh, you dictate your day more when you're an early riser, I think. Uh, uh, I think that's uh, definitely like one thing that uh, uh, makes a lot of uh, difference and uh, also, you know, keeping a lot of time to yourself for doing your own, uh, uh, you know, daily, uh, uh, you know, meditations or prayers and things like that. I think that keeps you grounded and uh, rooted, right? It's, I think that's a huge uh, aspect of our own culture and uh, so on, wherein, you know, we always uh, have, uh, there is a, a higher force to, to lean on when things go wrong. Right. So to, to keep, to keep that close to you, I think, uh, makes a huge difference. Karthik, I want to say thank you so much for taking the time and being on the inductive economy. I am absolutely thrilled that you took so, so much of time, interest and passion to answer these questions. And I hope you've had a spectacular time on the podcast. Yeah, it, it, it was a lot of fun, something I haven't done uh, enough. And uh, I think it was interesting, uh, a, a few, uh, Googlies that I had to handle, but uh, I think it was a lot of fun overall uh, having this chat. Uh, uh, looking forward, uh, you know, very nice work on Contraminds. Uh, wishing you guys all the best. Awesome.